Um, if people would like to, no pressure at all, but if you would like to add your pronouns to uh, your name on Zoom, and that way, if you end up asking questions or something, I'll be able to refer to you correctly. Um, and the way that you can do that is just in the top right hand side of your face. Um, there should be three little dots and then you have the option to rename. Perfect. Thanks, Patch. Nice to see you. It's been a minute. It was probably okay. almost this time last year. Sorry. You no, <laughs> <laughs> very fine. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this launch um, with Avid Reader and Where the Wild Things Are of this beautiful book, The Pronoun Lowdown by Nova Zissen. We're so pleased to be here this evening with you. And just before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I'm broadcasting from. That's the Yagara and Terrible People and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, a few of you have already purchased this gorgeous specimen of a book um, that I think should be in every household. But if you have not, I will be sharing with you a link throughout the evening where you can purchase it from. We will be offering 10% off any purchases you make through our website. So be sure to make use of that. The code is event and you can um, use that at any point and I'll be sharing that with you. Now um, on to the fun part. Oh one more thing if you have it um, Navo will be very pleased to answer any questions through um, throughout the event or coming to the, the end of it and so you can post any questions you have to me in the chat box and I will read them out. So about Navo. Navo is a queer non-binary Jewish writer, performer, activist and public speaker based in Nam, Biraranga, Melbourne. They run workshops and schools as well as professional development trainings and workplaces about transgender identity and language. Navo is the author of Finding Navo, a memoir on their gender transition that received the 2018 Australian Family Therapists Award. They are also a contributor, contributor to Kindred, 12 Queer Love Oswaye Stories an Australian young adult anthology. Navo is a mentor for the Pinnacle Foundation out of One for Australia's 30 Under 30 for 2019, and an ambassador for both Wear It Purple and the Victorian Pride Centre. They perform in Gender Euphoria, a live show featuring Australia's largest trans and gender diverse cast. Navo loves creating tiny fairy things out of polymer clay, dumpster diving and redistributing food to anyone in need and making Bloody Marys. Please join me in waving and a round of applause to welcome Navo. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that intro, Genevieve. I can always tell if someone is a bookseller or a book person based on how they pronounce uh, hashtag love OzYA. I've had a lot of people who are like, hashtag love Ozya. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, you are not in this world. And that's fine. Um, if people who don't have their cameras on would like to have their cameras on, uh, it would be really beautiful to be able to connect in this already a bit distant space um, and see all of your wonderful faces. But if you're not comfortable with that or you don't have the tech, that's so fine. Um, I will also do an acknowledgement of country shortly as part of my reading. Um, but before I sort of launch into a bit of a speech and all of that, I want to say that I would love for this to be a reciprocal and open space. I'm really grateful that you are all here with me, especially in a place that I don't live. And um, I feel a lot of gratitude that you would choose to spend your evening with me. So I hope that you will also take advantage of that and ask me any questions that you might have, um, or if you have your own storytelling and your own sharing that you would like to do, um, I would feel very privileged to be in that space with you. Um, I can very much talk forever as a public speaker that's not a problem for me um, but I think it will be much nicer if we can kind of share and engage together um, so if you do have questions even just as they pop up feel free to put them in the chat um, obviously after I've kind of finished my reading and stuff I will ask if people would like to say them out loud um, but yeah as we go feel free to just put them in the chat and then I can refer back to them afterwards um, and again if you'd like to just share some of your story very very open to that. 
Um, so I'd like to start with the acknowledgement of country. Usually I just sort of do one off the bat, but I thought it might be um, beautiful to share the one that I've got in here in the book. Um, I really hope that over the next few, well, I wish in the last few years and in the entirety of book writing that this was standard practice. Um, and I really hope to see more acknowledgements of country in books in future. Um, but I would also like to acknowledge the Yagara and Terrible people um, of Mianjin. And um, this book in particular was written in Nam Baranga uh, on the lands of the Kulin Nations and specifically the Wurundjeri and Bunurong peoples in so called Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the true custodianship of these people and that sovereignty has never been ceded. I want to try to hold in my heart the gravity and violence of binary Western notions of gender and the ways they have affected First Nations people, not just on the grounds of transphobia, but also deep seated white supremacy, racism and colonization. I strongly urge Australian readers to connect with local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organizations to pay the rent we owe as settlers. Um, and I think that's especially important because I think acknowledgements of country have become more common practice now, even in governments that go in and bulldoze sacred trees. Uh, so I really don't think that an acknowledgement suffices in the work that we need to do as settlers on stolen land. Um, and so I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and especially acknowledge First Nations LGBTIQA plus elders and all of the work that has been done as someone whose career and whose life is built upon the values of storytelling. I really want to honour the history of that storytelling on this land for 80,000 plus years. Um, and I just have the, the deepest respect for the caretakers of this country um, and these countries that we are all sort of chiming in from. Uh, so I am really excited to be launching this book. It's such a weird thing having a book that you've been working on for a while and then suddenly seeing them in people's hands around the country and now around the world. My first book did not make it around the world. Um, and this one is in Walmart and uh, a Portland bookshop today tagged me in a post and I was just like, this is so surreal. Uh, so I feel really excited that it's out there in the world that people can get their hands on it. I really hope that you enjoy it if you haven't already read it. And if you have that you did enjoy it. Um, I think that we are at a really pivotal moment in time. I think that we have been in a really pivotal moment in time for trans and gender awareness um, for the last, I guess, really, and I, I'm not trying to conflate this with my own journey, but since I came out, I've seen such a huge shift in trans and gender diverse discourse in this country and in the world. Again, I'm not, I'm claiming credit for that. It just so happened that it lined up that way. And I had this moment not that long ago. So I came out as trans in 2013. And at that moment in time, even though that's really not that long ago, you know, seven, eight years ago, at that moment in time, there was really no trans representation as far as I could find it. I mean, the only representation in the media that I saw were really Jerry Springer and like trans women fighting over their boyfriends on Jerry Springer. Uh, there was Boys Don't Cry, which is an incredibly tragic film played by a cis actor. I didn't know any trans people. I didn't see any trans people around me. Um, and so I really struggled to imagine my future. I didn't know what that could look like. To see what has happened in that time frame is really well and truly mind boggling. It's really not been such a long time. And yet in 2014, we had the transgender tipping point with Laverne Cox. We've had whether she's controversial or not. We've had Caitlyn Jenner. We've had so many people enter our kind of pop cultural lexicon. And I would, I would argue now that majority of people have heard or have some understanding of the word transgender, even if they don't know it and they've just heard the word. That is a really different position than we were when I came out in 2013. Um, I really feel as if a queer and trans revolution is right on its cusp or whether we're kind of in it right now or not is a different question. Um, and, you know, I've had so many moments where I've been watching old documentaries or old films based around the New York City ballroom scene. And I've just sort of been like, wow, what an amazing time in history. What a historic moment for the queer community. I wish that I was alive then. 
And then I look at all of my friends and I look at the creatives around me and I look at the activists around me and I'm like, I am alive in that moment, that actually history is happening around us all the time. And I think the really beautiful thing as well about the activist life cycle is that it's not a single life cycle, it is a generational life cycle. And so we are constantly picking the fruits of seeds that we did not sow, of seeds that our ancestors sowed many years ago. And we are now planting seeds that we will never reap the benefits of. And that is the life cycle. It is not this kind of instant gratuitous thing that we get from social media where we get a kind of rush of dopamine because we get a notification. It is a long game. And long games often result in burnout and it's a pretty hard time. And so we all have to be really mindful of the ways that we engage in that activism and how we care, not just for ourselves, but also for our community. I'm really passionate about pivoting conversations around self-care to a little bit more holistic and looking at community care, because I think when we individualize the process of care, we are also colonizing the process of care and we are capitalizing off the process of care and not thinking about it as a kind of wider movement and a wider responsibility that the the failings of people in our community to apply self-care to themselves is a failing of our community it's not of them as an individual um, and is a failing of the systems like it's not our fault that people cannot sustain themselves but it is our responsibility to help in that as much as we possibly can so I think there's a lot of things that kind of come into that long life cycle, but I also think the reward and the payoff is much greater than an instant gratification, um, that we will not see the world that we envision and that we imagine probably in our lifetime, um, but we are certainly making huge waves in order to progress that. And some of that I am really shocked to be able to, to see and have witnessed just in the eight years since I came out. So... I think it's really exciting. I think it's a really exciting time to be alive. I think it's a really exciting time to be trans um, and to be queer. And, you know, something I feel really passionate about is really pivoting the trans narrative from uh, a history and a narrative of dysphoria and tragedy and sadness and much more onto one of euphoria and celebration. Um, because I think, you know, not all trans people have experienced dysphoria. That is not a definitive element of transness. But I do believe that euphoria is a pretty definitive element. I think that lots of people have felt euphoria um, and that that has been an indication of their gender identity, maybe far more than feeling mm -hmm. a, a sadness or an aversion or something. So, yeah, I feel really passionate about that. And I think that, you know, pivoting that language as well is a really beautiful way of us reclaiming our stories from the kind of pathologized, um, institutionalized version of transness, the kind of born in the wrong body narrative, the born of this became of this, the ways that we kind of just recontextualize transness into our cis white frameworks of thinking about the world. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful thing for us to say, I'm not a before or after, I am a continuous fluid journey and I am always evolving and always changing like literally everyone is. Um, that dysphoria of discomfort in one's body is not exclusive to trans people, that it's a pretty universal experience. And if you, you know, if you've ever had a cis person say to you like, oh, it must be so hard to hate your body or it must be so hard to feel uncomfortable in your body. And it's sort of like, oh, okay, what does it feel like to not feel uncomfortable in your body ever? What is that like? What is it like to not want to make any changes to your external appearance? Oh, you, you don't know either? Wow, interesting. You know, we all make so many changes to the ways that we conform to gender, um, the ways that we assimilate into gender, whether it's going to the gym or going to the hair salon or getting your nails done or makeup or buying certain outfits or conforming in our behavioral processes. Like there are so many ways that we feel we must alter or change ourselves, whether it's from an autonomous choice or not is a different question, but we still do these things to change ourselves in order to reflect some of these gender norms. So I very much believe in the universality of a lot of these kind of topics um, and also in the celebration of a lot of these topics. It is a beautiful thing to be trans. It is a beautiful thing to be free of rigid binaries and rigid expectations. We are lucky to live our short lives in truth. I think being closeted or hiding is something that um, 
I wouldn't want to aspire to and I'm really grateful that I don't have to. I mean, I come out every couple of years just to keep people on their toes. Uh, so I think, yeah, that celebration is really something that I encourage and that I love to speak to. Um, and again, also for the people who have just joined us, feel free to join with your camera so that we can be in this space together. No pressure though. Um, and also if you have some questions as they come up, please feel free to ask them, chuck them in the chat um, and there'll be a little question time soon anyway. So on that kind of rant about queer politics and the trans revolution, um, I'd love to do a little bit of a reading from the book. This is just the introduction and we'll give you a little bit of context into my journey, um, my gender journey in short. Um, if you want a much deeper delve into my story and my journey, um, Finding Navarre is my first book and that is a memoir on my life. So we'll give a lot more context. This is a bit more um, of an educational guide, I, I guess. So starting on page six, I have had a long and complicated relationship with pronouns. I was assigned female at birth, and that word is really important, assigned. What does it mean to assign someone sex at birth? It's not just an observation of their genitals. This might dictate which toys a baby is gifted, what color their nursery is painted, and the outfits in which they'll be dressed. But this goes beyond infancy. For many, it will soar through to adulthood. Perhaps this assignation informs what career they have, how they're treated in society, and with whom they have romantic relationships. That's a lot of expectations for a baby. For the first four years of my life, I was fine being called she. I was busy learning how to walk, talk, and discovering solid foods. She was a piece of clothing, but it wasn't something I had chosen. It's not that it didn't fit. It's like I was wearing a tank top in the middle of winter. And for some reason, everywhere I went, clearly shivering from the cold, people would compliment my tank top. At the age of four, I started speaking up. I'm a boy, I'd say. I'm not a drama queen. I'm a drama king. Clearly very fine with being dramatic, regardless of what gender I just wanted to be gendered correctly in my drama. I would get angry whenever someone called me a girl, when anyone assumed I was a boy on the street or in the supermarket, I would feel this warm, sickly sweet feeling. It was like drinking hot apple cider after spending a day in the snow. I later learned this feeling was gender euphoria. If she was a tank, a tank top in winter, then he was a cashmere sweater. My parents thought it was a tomboy phase. They sent me to therapy, hoped it would fade, but the only reason it faded was because I learnt from the mean kids at school and the adults around me that there was something wrong with me. Kids don't know they're different until someone points it out. More often than not, parents have the best intentions when it comes to their children, but sometimes when they see that their child is different, in a bid to protect them from the outside world, they try to condition those behaviors out of them. Rather than protecting their children, what this act does is actually transform a parent into a child's first bully, one that they will always remember. For a while, this led me to repress my masculinity. I made new friends and reinvented myself, but nothing could mask the knowledge that I was different from these new friends. Why couldn't I be like everyone else? Why couldn't I just be happy? Why couldn't I just be normal? I thought these answers finally came when I realized I just needed to get new clothes. I came out as a lesbian at the age of 15 and neatly wrapped up my childhood with a tight bow. This explained why I was a tomboy. It was all just foreshadowing that I was a lesbian. Whew. I felt comfortable with that story and stored it away. But after a few years of living as an out lesbian, I still hadn't replicated that sickly sweet hot apple cider feeling. I was still wearing my she tank top and it was still bloody cold. I realized that I was transgender. People think these realizations are a light bulb moment, but for me, that bulb just illuminated a room full of monsters. 
Suddenly I could see everything and there was no turning the light off. There was really little representation of transness in the media and none in my peers or role models. I found medical language online which tried to explain my visceral experience. Born in the wrong body, a man's brain in a female body. I did not have poetry then. I began a medical transition and surrounded myself with people who understood me best, to whom I didn't have to justify my existence. I wore the cashmere he every day. But I quickly noticed how the expectations around my behavior changed. I traded one limited box of gendered stereotypes for another. It was a gendered bait and switch. The new cashmere sweater started to suffocate. It was too tight, too itchy. For so long, I was frustrated with myself. I'd changed my body to fit my sweater. I felt better, stronger, and more like myself, but it still wasn't right. I didn't want to perform masculinity. I accepted that I was never born in the wrong body. I was born in the wrong world. I just wanted people to treat me as me. That's when I came out again as non-binary. I don't regret how much I sacrificed to be he, but when I found they, I discovered a lightweight material that stretched, stayed temperate through the seasons and was infinitely colorful. Come with me on a journey to explore the kaleidoscopic and complicated world of gender. We'll only see the tip of the iceberg, but that's a start. First though, I am not a spokesperson for trans and gender diverse communities. I am just me. An Ashkenazi Jewish non-binary person who is assigned female at birth and who presents as a combination of masculine and feminine. I am queer. I grew up in an economically stable household in suburban Melbourne, Australia. I am able-bodied and neurotypical with generous access to resources, support and community, something that not everyone in our LGBTIQA plus communities have access to. This book looks at flashpoints in our community's fight for equality, including the violent hate crimes that are part of these histories. Along with some simple guides to gender in language and culture, this book also suggests some helpful resources and provides a helpful, sorry, useful resources and provides a helpful glossary at the, at the back of the book. Of course, the lived experiences of trans and gender diverse people cannot be packaged up neatly into colorful hardbacks. They are messy, and raw and complicated and deeply human. But I'm certain that this book would have come in handy for me when I was still shivering in that tank top. Thank you. So I'd love to have a conversation with you all. Um, I'm wondering if any questions are coming up for any of you, things that you would like to know, clarification points or sharing that you might wanna do about your own story and your own journeys. Um, as I said, you're more than welcome to put some of those questions in the chat and I can read them out loud. If you feel like uh, coming off mute, you are welcome to ask your question aloud. Um, and if you don't have any questions, I'm sure I can find things to speak about, uh, but I will give a moment and I will drink some of my wine. I encourage you to do the same if you have access to it. I will just mention that, well, thank you, first of all. Um, but uh, some people ha have sent questions through, but you've sent them just directly to me as the host. So if you'd just like to send it through, um, make sure you select to everyone and then you, um, that will come through to everyone. Cool. I can. I can share, um, Verity's question actually came through very early. Um, Verity was wondering or saying that they were always interested in book covers. Could you tell me about how your covers are developed and mm -hmm. how much input do you have in them? That's such a cool question. I love questions that are just about the craft of book writing. I often don't get them as a, as a trans person. People don't really ask me what my hobbies are or what my writing process is. It's always teach me about the intimate details of your life. So thank you for that question. It makes me feel like an author. Um, it's such a good question. I, with Finding Navarre, I had quite a bit of input. I had said to them that I I wanted it to be an image of my face, but I didn't want it to be a photo of my face because that feels so weird. And that's such a like celebrity memoir thing where they just have photos of their face and you're like, great, I wouldn't have known you by name anyway. So thank goodness you're here. Um, and then the book designer did a drawing of me, like a sort of line drawing. 
And I was actually blown away by how well they represented me because I don't think it's easy to draw a non-binary person. I actually think it's quite risky to draw someone with dysphoria because you could so easily go either direction in the ways that you're perceiving them. So that I, I had a lot of input in. This one, I think that I... I had a fair bit. I mean, it was more like they did a few mock-ups and then I was like, yeah, this works, this doesn't. I really, really wanted this new um, or newer rainbow flag to be incorporated. So it's the it's the rainbow flag that also has the trans colours and the black and brown stripes as well, which just honours um, our history as being a movement basically founded and pioneered by um, particularly trans women of colour. Um, but also our ancestors of all kind of black and brown um, racial experiences who have really pioneered a lot of the work that we have access to now. Uh, so yes, I really wanted that in there and I was the one who put that in there. Um, I had input in the colors. I definitely chose the colors and which like geometric shapes I liked. <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole concept I think was mostly the book designer there. Um, and throughout the pages was also very much kind of theirs, but I guess they based them a lot off my titles, which were mostly chosen by me. Yeah. Beautiful. And I really felt, felt when you were talking about um, gender identity, wanting to um, perceive it as um, more of a celebration and looking forward in that kind of way, I felt like your book and its overall aesthetic really exists as a, as a like celebration. And it ha has this overall feel of positivity, I think. Like yeah, just I'm so glad. And I think I want it to be exciting. You know, I think that was also the thing is that, especially now there are a lot of people who really want to engage with this topic and want to learn more about gender and about pronouns and are very well-meaning and also very anxious babes like and don't want to get things wrong and just find the whole thing a little bit intimidating I mean I work with cis people all the time in like my main job is um, doing professional development around trans and gender identity and so I go into a lot of these workplaces don't get me wrong there are lots of people who don't mean well or who are like just big jerks and they're a lot harder to convert um, but there's a lot of very well-meaning cis people who really want to understand and want to get it right and just find the whole thing quite overwhelming and I think that's why book I find books like this really important and I wanted it to be easy to just pick up and be like okay this doesn't have to be a really scary thing it's all here okay it's telling me I'm gonna get things wrong thank goodness because I do and okay I'm human oh my god trans people also mess up each other's pronouns wow that's really good to know and oh there are drawings and and things are in really bite-sized information you know like I think a lot of this stuff has been made really inaccessible by very academic ways of approaching theory and I think academia is really important, but I also think it's elitist as hell. Um, and I really believe that if you can't explain something to a three-year-old, you probably don't understand it. I don't care how many big words you can use in a sentence. I don't care how many incredible thinkers you can reference. If you can't explain something to a three-year-old, you don't get it. Um, so I think about that a lot in my approach to education is like, how would I explain this to the kids in my life? Um, when they ask me if I'm a boy or a girl, what do I say to them? And then I take that approach to explain it to others, not in a patronizing way or a condescending way, but in a, we are all just actually kids navigating this really big, scary world, trying to understand it. And at some point in our journey, we stop asking questions because it's no longer acceptable to be curious and to be open-minded and wide-eyed about the world. At some point, you're expected to just know but no one knows. Adults just get better at pretending. So I think it's actually really kind of a relief when someone is there being like, I know that you're confused and I know that you want to learn and let's come on this learning journey together. I'm not an expert, but I'm also just trying to figure things out and I'd love to learn with you and I think we can all grow and I think that will be really fun and beautiful. So that was really my intention as well with the kind of accessibility and the like fun brightness was like, we're all big kids, let's learn. There's so much to learn. What an exciting world we live in that that's an opportunity to us. Um, and let's do it together, you know, because I wouldn't have gotten to where I am now if it wasn't for patient, beautiful people who led me on that process. And if you ever meet anyone who's on their high horse about all the stuff they know, it's like, okay, but who led you there? 
how did you get there? Did you get there from standoffish people on the internet? Probably not. <laughs> That's such a wonderfully empathetic um, perspective to take the world on with. I mean, it's not every day. That does sound <laughs> empathetic. Some days I'm like, get fucked, Google it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it just really depends. And I think, I think it's a reciprocal relationship. I think it's a mutual relationship. I think that when people come to me with openness and care and love, I will reciprocate that same energy. But if they come to me with entitlement and judgment and rudeness, I will reciprocate that energy. I don't owe anyone patience and gentleness if they're not going to offer me the same respect. Did you have more questions there, Genevieve, or should I go to... Oh, uh, no, sorry. Yeah, um, I think you can move on to Patch's question. Cool, awesome. Um, so Patch has asked in the chat, and I'll just read it out. Um, how do you answer that question from kids? Are you a boy or a girl? I work at a primary school and get asked this all the time. I was told by management to say, I'm just Patch, I'm just me, and I don't have to be a boy or a girl. Now I'm at the point where if kids ask me, other kids chip in and answer the question for me, they're just Patch. That's so cute. Oh my God, I love kids. They're such good people. Oh, kids are so much easier than adults, hey? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I approach it differently, probably because I approach that question differently in my body every day. Um, when I was a swimming teacher, so I used to be a swimming teacher for babies, six months plus, and when my sort of three-year-olds used to ask me that question, I would just say both or neither or does it matter? And they would be like, no, can we do backstroke now? Yes, absolutely, sure. And it's like, actually, that is more important right now in our half an hour swimming lesson than my gender. Um, yeah, I mean, I had kids that I used to babysit. They said to me once, do you have boy bits or girl bits? And I said, um, I just have me bits. And they were like, yeah, cool. Can we go on the trampoline? You know, and it was like really as simple as that. And especially I think young people, because they are non-sexualized entities, because they don't have a connection with their body in relation to other people in any sort of way, it makes sense that their body is just a me body. Um, and they haven't quite fit themselves into that world yet. Um, so yeah, I find it much easier to explain to children um, and, you know, I've had a few conversations with my nibblings. Nibbling is a really good way, uh, word, by the way. It's a gender neutral term for niece or nephew, like sibling, but with an N and cute because you want to nibble them because they're so cute. Um, so my nibblings, you know, we haven't had heaps of conversations about me being trans, but I think it's probably quite obvious to them. I mean, I did wear my queer crop top to see them today. So like surely they, they know. Um, but I remember one time my nibbling said to me, she was probably three at the time. And she said, Navor, they call me Spunkle, by the way, Spunky Uncle. There's not a lot of gender neutral terms for aunt or uncle. So Spunkle is a cute one. They call me Spunkle Navor. And Safira said to me once, she said, Navor, you're a girl and I'm a girl and mummy's a girl. And I was like, okay, yeah, cool. Am, am, I, am I a girl? Am I? And she said, yeah, because sometimes girls can be boys and boys can be girls and that's how nature works. <laughs> and I was like, okay, great. <laughs> like you're the boss. <laughs> All right. And, you know, one time she was wearing a dress and I said to her, oh, I love that dress. I want to wear that dress. And she was like, no, you can't. And I got really upset. I was like, oh, no, why can't I? And she said, it's too little. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, it is too little. You're right. You know, so I think, like, kids are so open-minded and they're so imaginative and they're so creative and we, we just we just push the creativity out of them. We just push the imagination out of them. We just repress it and we push it down. We tell kids they can be whatever they want to be. And then as soon as they get a bit older, we're like, oh no, not like that. No, not like that. No, you can't be an artist. You can't be a writer. That's not going to get you anywhere. No, you can't dress like that. That's silly. Or that's home clothes, not going out clothes. And, you know, we kind of just contradict ourselves so much in the messages that we give young people. And I think that we have a lot to learn from them about their innov innovation and imagination. Um, and I really love listening to what they have to say about the world. Cause what my nibbling said to me about sometimes boys are girls and girls are boys. I was like, yeah, that's right. Like there have been 
entire PhD theses that have tried to explain what you just did in one sentence. <laughs> and it's like, you got it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, amazing. Um, I was actually wondering, I don't think we have any other questions yet. I was wondering if you could share with us how you went about choosing what went into the book and what like didn't and how you went about kind of categorizing um, just the, I guess more of the overall writing process. Yeah, cool. That's a great question. Um, I was very overwhelmed because Smith Street came to me and asked me to write the book on pronouns and they, and so I was a bit like, well, what do you want me to put in it? And they were like, no, no, it's your book. And I was like, well, I didn't come up with the idea. Like you tell me. Um, so it was a bit back and forth and, you know, I really want to, I want to um, say this because I think we have perceptions of people as not having the same issues as we do, but I just want you to know that like, I really battle in a big way with imposter syndrome and I very much like through this book process was like, I'm not the right person to be writing on this. I don't know enough. I'm not a historian. I'm not a linguist. I'm not qualified in any of these areas I don't even really have time to do much research because the turnover is so fast for when my manuscript is due um, like I had maybe a couple of months before I had to get my first manuscript in so that was a lot of pressure and I was just calling my editor all the time being like I think you should go somewhere else and he was like no I think you should just sit down and write and I was like whoa brutal call out but okay, I'll give that a go. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a big question. I think one of the really guiding factors for me, I looked at a lot of, um, well, there aren't a lot, but I looked at some 101 pronoun guides and I guess I just found a lot of them quite binary. Um, and I just found a lot of them really whitewashed. And I think that we really do silo a lot of these issues. We talk about racism, sexism, transphobia, ableism, fat phobia is very kind of separate ideas, but they all come from the same machinations of power. They come from the same oppressive weapons and they imagine the same kind of world on the other side. You know, they, they look at beauty standards through the same lens. And I think we do a real injustice when we separate them. And I think if we see ourselves in solidarity with one another constantly, then we will do much better in liberating all of us from our suffering. And so a really huge book that informed a lot of my writing was a book called um, Decolonizing Trans Slash Gender 101, um, which is by B. Binolan. And I found it just kind of by chance through a friend and it's like not widely available or anything, but it's basically, it's a whole book call out of another trans 101 guide it's pretty much like breaking that guide down and being like this is where they messed up and this is where they messed up and don't do this and whatever and so I was like this is a cautionary tale <laughs> I'm going to read this and I don't think I did a perfect job I think I have a lot of work to do and as someone who is you know my proximity to whiteness is so close that I like I'm basically white um, which is a whole complicated another thing but um for the sake of argument's sake, I'm, I'm white. As a white person, I have a lot to unlearn. I have a lot to um, disembody from the ways that I process the world. And I, I'm sure that I didn't do a perfect job at all, especially when talking about genders around the world because they are not of my cultural background and because so many of the explanations of those genders are also incredibly whitewashed and because English is a colonial language. So as soon as you're translating things into English, it's just really hard to do um so I found a lot of that very very difficult but that book really showed me what I need to cover what would be really important to talk about um so that it wasn't just another one of those kind of whitewashed 101 trans guides um and I really hope that people will be able to see themselves in that a little bit more and I guess I didn't want to do the completely 101 thing I didn't want to dilute this narrative so that parents will pick it up and just be like, oh, this is super easy to understand. And now I get the whole thing. I wanted to place it in a historic context as well. So we've got a timeline of about a hundred years of trans history in the book. Um, I've got 
lots of film, television and book recommendations of representation. Um, and that was really important to me because I really wanted to show that this is this book isn't me. This book is an amalgamation of an entire history and generations of trans activism um, that I am just kind of reaping the benefits of um, and will hopefully plant many seeds for others to reap the benefits of in time. So yeah, I don't know, it just popped up. And then honestly, like a week before it went to print, I was like, fuck, I haven't done anything on neo pronouns. Like shows how bloody in my own world I am because I was just like, blah, blah, they, them. And then I was like, oh my God, kids are going to read this and be like, who is this old grandpa who forgets about all of the new words that everyone's using now? And so I put a spread on neo pronouns at like the last minute, which thank God. And, and I think that is something I would go back and do differently. I would do a lot more about that and a lot more about people using multiple pronouns and how to do that and, you know, but there was so much to do. I was given 12,000 words. I ended up writing 20,000 words. They went to print with 20,000 instead, which is like, thank God, thank God I didn't try to cut that out. Um, but yeah, I guess my presentations as well informed a lot of the writing because I do 101 workshops. And so I was like, well, what do I do in my workshops and how can I put that in? And when I give my speeches, what are the key parts of my story that are good learning moments and um yeah yeah I think that's kind of how it went <laughs> yeah and well also as you explained that it kind of I, I imagine it clicked for everyone else as well being like oh we can see why Smith Street approached you <laughs> yeah yeah that's lovely I yeah I really I really appreciated it a lot and I have lots of I have lots of other book ideas that are on the hopefully on the burner at some point but there I'm likely going to be moving more into the fiction world a little bit so um, oh wow can you share any of your thoughts in that area I can yes so at the moment I'm working on a book with my creative partner Alison Evans so if anyone is familiar with them they're an amazing non-binary author who is just like they're a brilliant writer. I've learned so much from them about writing. I feel like they've been a real mentor to me. So they have three books out at the moment. Um, one is called Euphoria Kids and is very beautiful. All of their writing is young adult fiction, um, but it's beautiful for everyone. I mean, I mostly read young adult. Adult books are too depressing and serious and slow moving. And I just, my life is already like that sometimes. So I don't need that. Um, but yeah, their books are brilliant. And we are writing a middle grade book at the moment. Um, so middle grade is just like a little bit younger than young adult. And we're hoping it will be a trilogy. Uh, but we're on our second draft of our manuscript. We don't have a publisher or anything at this stage. Uh, but basically, it's about two non-binary 12-year-olds who find each other and become best friends. And they've always felt like they're different, but not, not entirely because they're non-binary, but also because they have superpowers. So it's kind of a magic realism thing. The, the superpowers are very, like, cute like um willow our one of our protagonists she can grow things and shrink them so she's really into gardening and she uses her growing skills to grow her lettuces bigger than they might be otherwise <laughs> and um and sage the other protagonist is able to internalize knowledge that they read on the page so if they read a recipe or they read how to play basketball or they read whatever they can kind of perform those tasks for a limited time only um, so that's really fun and basically they team up together to save the community gardens from an evil politician who's trying to build apartments so it's very cute it's very wholesome we really hope that it will get published um, and then I have a couple of book ideas that are going to be much longer projects that are probably more adult books um, that are not ready to be spoken about just yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a couple of um, moments, uh, a couple of messages in the chat that it might be nice, uh, a little bit of sharing there um, from Candice and then a, a question as well. So I thought I might let... Did you um, want to read them or shall I? Uh, um, well, Candace has said thanks, just wants to say this is fabulously written this book. Uh, Candace, we have your book in the mail for you. Uh, Candace and Neil here, and we are parents of a non binary teen, so we are navigating how to talk to relatives and friends and explain what that means. The younger generation are already all over it, huh? Look forward to reading the book we've ordered, and nice to hear you say it's okay not to always get it right. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And yeah, I'm so with you. Like, I think, I think young people really are all over it. I say that as a young person, but even just meeting younger people, I mean, I go into schools and sometimes the way they're speaking, I'm like, I feel old and I'm 25. So what does that mean for other generational gaps, you know? Um, so I think, yeah. And I think that's a really big part as well of being an advocate for your child is having to advocate for them in the context of your friends and family. And that can be really challenging, especially if they're disapproving or, or judgmental about the choices that you're making. So I think it's really brilliant to be as informed as you can be and have resources you can pass along. And hopefully having those resources also substantiates the validity of what you're saying a little bit. You're like, oh, I didn't come up with this. It's in a book, you know, it's in like the Oxford Dictionary, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says they, them is a real word. So it's not me. Um, and I find that stuff really helpful as well. So yeah, I really hope that that, that helps in that process too. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from Patch. About to be co-facilitating a trans and GNC kids support group through Relationships Australia in Brisbane. I feel lots of imposter syndrome and fear about trying to be there for the kids and their carers especially as I am far from having my own trans journey finished or trauma resolved. Are there any resources, messages that you would recommend for either a first time facilitator or for the families themselves? Sorry, this is a huge question. Don't apologize, Patch, that's so fine. Um, I think firstly, I wanna say that if you had come to me and said, hey, just like as a person who's finished my trans journey and has all my trauma resolved, that would be a huge red flag for me. <laughs> I would be like, wow, you sound like someone who doesn't have their trauma resolved and hasn't finished their trans journey. You know, like, I don't think either of those things are static journeys. I don't think that either of them can ever be finished. And I actually think that as soon as you feel like they're finished, that's when there's reason for concern. Um, I would say that my trans journey is nowhere near finished because my life is hopefully nowhere near finished and I have a lot more growing and learning and evolving to do and I don't want to back myself into any kinds of corners. I don't know what that's going to look like throughout my life and even if I do resolve most of my trauma, who knows what's on the horizon? very open to more trauma coming to me over the years. Existence is trauma. Um, so yeah, I certainly wouldn't use that as reasons to discredit yourself. I think if anything, that gives you more credit that you are really open to growing and learning with these young people and with their families. I really believe that performative confidence goes a long way. I think that if you were just like, I am damn qualified for this job, whether you believe it or not, saying that over and over again to yourself will actually embody it. And it will often have the blowback effect that people will think that of you. I don't walk into spaces being like, hi, I'm so sorry I'm here. I don't really know why I'm here. I'm not really a good speaker and I'm not really good at my job because people will discredit me immediately. And a lot of the times people already want to discredit me. So if I walk in and I'm like, I'm the best public speaker you'll ever see and I'm ready to do this and I'm going to show you what you need to learn. People are like, damn, okay, I'll just better sit down and be quiet, you know? So I think that like, even if I, and then afterwards I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Or like, I absolutely don't believe that. Um, and I really don't. Um, so I think that is something I would tell you is that every person that you look up to or every person that you believe has an air of confidence that you don't is just a bit better at pretending and is also feeling imposter syndrome probably most of the time if they don't feel imposter syndrome chances are that they're a white cis het man um, and they just haven't been conditioned by the world to question themselves so i would urge you to carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man um, but maybe with a little bit more uh tact and a little bit more awareness of your positionality um, because really if every white cis het mediocre man questioned themselves even 15% as much as we do, we would probably have much better art, music and politics in this world. Uh, so just do it, you know, like you don't have to be the best person at the job, you just have to do it. And you're opening the door for more people, you will learn, you will grow. As long as you are opening the space to admit that you are wrong and to admit that you are learning, I think that it's fine, you know, and I think that you'll probably do a really fantastic job and you'll realise that you're way more qualified than you think you are. Yeah. We have a um, statement from Rebecca. 
I'm not a question, but when I was in primary school, I only really wanted to collect cicada shells, read books and build cuppies. I also loved horses and my little pony. But when I initiated games in the playground, which didn't happen often, it was wild horses. But I had to be the stallion in the herd of wild brumbies that only just clicked and I just turned 40. <laughs> I love that. That's so good. Um, and yeah, I think that is like such a beautiful testament as well to the lives of young people. You know, there are so many fun things to explore and to be and to do. And I mean, that's how I really feel about clothing. I wear what I want to wear. I wear what is comfortable, what is weather appropriate and what is appropriate for the event that I'm going to, which are already quite a few filters of what I can, can't wear. I also don't need to add on to that the extremely rigid filter of what has been pre-designated for me based off my genitals, you know, or based off the way that I present. Like, I don't need to do that. I'm going to wear something that is appropriate and that's all that really matters to me. And it's the same of like, I just want to read books and build cubbies and I don't care what was like pre-designated for my gender, you know, like what a silly thing. And to categorize 7.8 billion people into two categories of any kind just seems completely absurd. It's just like, it's just ridiculous, you know? I mean, even when we are talking about cis identity, for those of you who do identify as cis in the space, I'm sure that, for example, if you are a cis woman, the way that you embody your womanhood, the way that you connect with your womanhood, the way that you dress and you express yourself is so different to another woman, you know, is maybe different from any other woman. Your connection to your body, your connection to the self, your connection to the ideas around motherhood or life giving or anything, you know, or your periods or whatever, I'm sure that you have very different relationships to them than any other woman, because we are deeply individual, unique people. And we discredit ourselves and our own individuality when we fit ourselves into these massive boxes that simply can't encompass us. We are so much more complicated than that, you know, and it just does an injustice. It, it really suffocates the magic out of existence when we do that you know, and I, I don't believe that anyone is liberated by it. That's the thing. When I do the kind of work I do, I'm not just doing it for trans people. I am looking at every little boy and every little girl and saying, you deserve more. You deserve more than that. You deserve more than these limitations. I don't meet people who are like, really gender norms. I love them. I feel super liberated by them. You know, when people tell me that I'm just on my period, when I'm trying to be impassioned about something, I love when they say that because I am always on my period, you know, and it informs everything I think. <laughs> like I've never heard that. I've never heard the man who says when I was a kid and I got injured and I fell off my bike and my dad told me to man up. That was great. So glad he said that. Haven't had any emotions since, <laughs> you know, like I don't think that these restrictive categories are empowering for anyone. I think that rigid gender binaries are what has caused male violence in the world. I think that it has caused so much frustration, so much like disconnect from emotions, um, so much disembodiment that there is so much rage in its place, you know? And I think the ways that like women within patriarchy and within feminism have repressed their own needs and desires and sexuality and dreams is because of these rigid gender norms, you know? So when I talk about liberating trans people from this, I'm talking about liberating us all. And I think that is what true liberation is, is that it is going to liberate everyone who is suffering. It, it doesn't mean that we are then putting others down, which is why it's so frustrating to see trans exclusionary radical feminists feeling so threatened by trans politics, because it's like, we are on the same team as you. If you actually understood what we were talking about, you would know that we want your liberation just as much as we want ours. That me being a non-binary person does not threaten your womanhood, and that someone who was assigned male at birth does not threaten your womanhood, being a woman. She's on your team. She's a woman, you know? Um, yeah, that's my, that's my rant. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I think I'd now love to just unmute everyone and ask them all to join us in thanking you. I cannot imagine a better way to spend my Friday night. This has been just wonderful. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> Um, so I'll just take a moment and unmute you all. And if you would join me, 
Oh, I'll do that. I'll do that muting first. <laughs> if you would join me in just thanking Navo with a round of applause, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm. And congratulations.